In this problem, we're given B, the position of a unicyclist, as a function of time. And we're also given the unicyclist's velocity as a function of time, but not in any symbolic form, but rather we're given the values of position and velocity for selected uh, points in time. And from that, we're asked to find, to answer a series of questions. What I put over here on the right are some reminders and formulas that are going to be useful in working through the problem. And I'll reference those as we get to the appropriate part of the problem. Part A asks us to find acceleration. Now we know from the diagram here that the relationship between velocity and acceleration is that of taking the derivative with respect to time or more generally that of finding the slope in an approximate uh, form for certain intervals of time. And because it does ask for an approximation here, we intend to use the approximate uh, way of calculating the slope uh, based on the data that we have. So <clears throat> we're going to approximate a of 5 by writing the velocity at 10 minus the velocity at 0, namely the change in velocity over that time period, over the change in time, which is 10 minus 0. That comes out to putting in the actual values, 0.03. Now what about the units? Well, the velocity itself is meters per second, and then we're dividing by seconds, so our units are meters per second squared. Part B asks us to interpret the meaning of this expression. And we note in particular the absolute value bars. Well, the uh, signed area or integral of the absolute value of velocity with respect to time over a given time interval is the total distance traveled. And because the velocity is in units of meters per second and we're integrating with respect to time, then our units are meters. Again, because we're not given the function in symbolic form, but just at a few data points, we're asked to approximate this value. And they specifically tell us to use a left Riemann sum. Okay, so let's recall that a left Riemann sum simply indicates that to approximate the signed area under a curve, we break it up into a series of intervals of not necessarily equal width, and then we take the leftmost value of the independent variable, in this case time, to determine the height, in this case the velocity at that time, we use that as the height of the entire rectangle. Then we add up the areas of these rect rectangles. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the height at 0 times the width, which in this case is from 0 to 10. And then we're going to add to that the height at, I say height, but I really should be writing here. Let's just fix that. It's height in a generic sense, but let's, uh, let's say a, a velocity at 0 times a width of 10 seconds plus the velocity at um, 10 times a width of 30 seconds plus the velocity 
at 40 times a width of 20 seconds. And notice that because it's a left Riemann sum, the final value of the velocity at 60 seconds doesn't even come into play. Here this, we use this height, this height, and this height, but because it's left Riemann, we don't, this height is left out. We never make use of, um, I guess what I should say is we never make use of this height here. Well, putting in our values, we have, uh, let's see, 2.0 times 10. Uh, this is 2.3 times 30. And this is going to be 2.5 times 20. And so we have 20 plus 69 plus 50. And that's going to equal 139 meters. What about part C? Part C asks whether there must be a time. Okay? Well, that word must ought to tip us off to the fact that this involves some kind of theorem of calculus which guarantees a certain outcome if certain conditions are met. Now, many might think initially, because the question has to do with uh, the velocity at some point in, a, in an interval, and because the velocity is given, that it might be the intermediate value theorem for continuous functions. That theorem is certainly satisfied. Namely, we have a continuous function on a closed interval. Now, why do we know that the velocity is continuous? because they told us that b is twice differentiable. So we know that the uh, derivative of b with respect to time exists, and that's a velocity. But since it's twice differentiable, we also know that the derivative of the velocity with respect to time exists. And so that guarantees the continuity of the velocity. So we know that the intermediate value theorem can be applied, but if you notice, the values that were given are um, 2.5 and 4.6. So all that the intermediate value theorem can guarantee us is that every intermediate value between 2.5 and 4.6 is reached during that time interval, somewhere during that time interval. We're being asked to see if we can prove that the value two meters per second is reached. So we can't draw that conclusion from the intermediate value theorem. However, it's important to remember that just because the intermediate value theorem guarantees all those intermediate values, it doesn't rule out other values. And in fact, there's another theorem that applies, and that's the mean value theorem. So the mean value theorem specifically for derivatives is also applicable in this case, and that's what I've highlighted over here. If you have a function that's continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, then there is some point in that interval where the average slope is exactly equal to the slope of the tangent line, or in other words, the derivative evaluated at some point. It doesn't tell us which point but it does guarantee that that value will be the same. So the intermediate value theorem doesn't help us here, but we try the mean value theorem now. And so let's uh, calculate what that guaranteed slope is. So we'll write, using the mean value theorem, which I'm just going to abbreviate as MVT uh, for derivatives, Uh, the average slope, or more generally, I'll call it the average rate of change on the interval, is, uh, let's see, uh, we have uh, position at 60 is 49. And the position at 40 is 9. 
and the time that I'm dividing by is 20 and so I get uh, 40 over 20 or 2 meters per second. Now note, I did not use data about the velocity in order to calculate the average rate of change of the velocity. I used data about the position because it's the slope of the position in small time intervals that gives me an approximation to the velocity. So the average velocity is found by taking the slope between the two endpoints, and that's how we've come up with two meters per second. Okay, so let's just add an, a note here that says because the conditions of the mean value theorem for derivatives are met by the fact that b is twice differentiable okay because those conditions are met namely we know that B is continuous on the interval AB because B is differentiable. And a function can't be differentiable unless it's already continuous. Similarly, um, we know that the function is differentiable on the open interval because we know that B is twice differentiable. And therefore, uh, we have a function that's both continuous and differentiable and therefore the mean value theorem applies okay therefore somewhere for t between 40 and 60 sorry that should be the open interval um, we must have V of T equal to 2 meters per second and that's for sum T equals C Finally, part D is a related rates problem. They're giving us a formula that connects the distance to a light with the position. And from that, we're asked to find a relationship between the velocity that we have to the rate of change of the distance. Remember, a related rates problem is one where we find an equation of the quantities, use that equation to differentiate, to gain a new equation that will then relate the rates in question. And because we're asked to find the rate of change of L, and we're given the rate of change of B, we need a formula that connects them. Fortunately, that's supplied, and so we write, we have L of t squared equals 12 squared plus B of t squared. And so differentiating with respect to time, With respect to time, we obtain 2 L of t dL dt equals 2 B of t dB dt. 
now we can use the information that we have about that particular instant in time where t equals 40. So at t equals 40, we have L of 40 times dl dt at 40. That's the thing we're trying to find. And that's equal to um, b of 40 times db dt at t equals 40. Notice that I've canceled out the 2's. I can just drop those from the equation. So all we really have to know is these given values. And how do we find L at 40? Well, L at 40 is going to be 12 squared plus B at 40 squared, and then we'll take the square root. So we have the square root of 144. B at 40 is given as 9, so that'll be 144 plus 81. Okay. Let's put uh, B at 40. We found that just now. We know that's 9. And we also know that dB dt is the same as uh, the velocity. And at 40, that's 2.5. So solving for dL dt, we have that dL dt at 40 equals 9 times 2.5 over the square root of, when we add 144 and 81, we get 225, whose square root is 15. So now we have 9 times 5 halves, over 15, which equals 3 halves, and of course our units would have to be meters per second.